Hey, you, you've got to get some practice in reading. So you'll be doing Great. Four, there's four sections. It's on the idea of transience, but also the glance of the eye in the instant. Um, but there's four sections, so we have four different readers. So you take the first section. Okay. Transience, glance of the eye, and the instant. Fragility, impermanence, rupture, momentary, becoming, nothingness, disillusion, invisibility, discontinuity. Four parts. Vermeer and transience, Koldelka and the eye, glance of the eye, Clarice Lispector and the instant, and the Zen Enso and emptiness. Vermeer was known in his time, but then seemed to disappear from art history until he was recognized as a forerunner of Impressionism. It was as if the sense contained within his art eluded an entire passage of time. <clears throat> Vermeer, Girl with the Pearl Earring, 1665. It's in the, um, in Holland, in the um, Moritz house. The image appears to be still and yet something passes through. What passes does not signify, but rather it is closer to a trembling of nothingness located between the before and beyond of the image. Vermeer, The Lace Maker, 1670. Transiences are opposed to permanence because they are always something else outside of recognition. Vermeer, Girl with a Red Hat, 1666. So I believe it's in Washington, in the United States. The image appears on the edge of space between empty and full. As an image, it fails to designate, and as such, is without meaning. But it is this quality that marks its singularity. It evades yet entices, draws inwards, and yet conceals, offering something that cannot be returned. Vermeer, Woman with the Pearl Necklace, 1664. It is as if she is making an offering to light itself, but perhaps this is also saying too much. Transience is in between state, is in between a state of being out there and beyond. So let someone in. So, sorry. Vermeer, the Astronomer, 1668. The extent of the world and the sense of the instant are drawn together, becoming as always in the middle because the middle is nowhere and hence unfixed. Transience is the trembling of the middle. Vermeer, Girl Reading a Letter at an Open Window, 1659. A woman reads a letter. She is alone in front of a window. What comes next? It is as if something is in the air. Vermeer, lady writing a letter with her maid, 1671. Transiences are behind everything, but behind transients, there is nothing. They are the authors of their own power of dissolution. Vermeer, the guitar player, 1672. Transients cannot be seen. They are both invisible and inaudible. They appear to reside in a state of not being from which they erupt. Vermeer, girl with a flute, 1670. The absolute rule of thought is to return the world as we received it, unintelligible. And if it is possible to return it a little bit more unintelligible, a little bit more enigmatic. John Baudrillard. 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 
So um, we've got an option. We can go through the whole thing in sequence, the four sections together, or we can stop at each one because each work in them as a, a unit in themselves. So I would like to discuss the Vermeer section by itself, first of all, or, or shall we go on? I mm -hmm. think discussing Maybe. it would be good. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Brenda. Oh, sorry, Lester. I just said yes, I think that would be a good idea, but it's up to, I mean, I'm not, you know, whatever people want. Yeah, I was going to say basically the same thing. To, discuss, yeah. to go on or to discuss now? Discuss. 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 Okay, let's discuss. We'll go backwards to the beginning. I've got mixed up here. Gone too far, I think. What? Have you gone too far? Have you gone? It, it looked back. Mm. It's funny, it's not, not functioning. Let's go on. We'll read on. Okay. And could you read this? Who? Panda. Okay. Oh, can you please go back to uh, Baudrillard Court and start from there? I, I'd really like that, uh, if it's okay. Just one more. Yeah, thank you. Can I read that again? Well, I will. <laughs> Um, the absolute rule of thought is to return the world as we received it, <clears throat> unintelligible. And if it is possible to return it a little bit more unintelligible, a little bit more enigmatic. I think that's the same for an artist rather than yeah. a <clears throat> What's what's the sense here? I mean, I, I I get the sense of you know, there's like a perception or something that is you you can't feel almost that you can't kind of below thought, um, but that's what you're absorbing and passing on. I don't know if it's a delusion kind of thing, or that this. Um... This idea of trembling, which doesn't settle, is is the productive foundation of the present, which is enigmatic. Mm, it's beyond language as well, maybe just. At the moment, I am reading Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino, second time around. Yeah, some of you might be familiar with it. And uh, what I was saying, First time I read it all through, and then now I'm reading section by section with cities with desire or cities with memory on their own. And the more I read it, the more invasive it becomes. It's sort of all falling apart, and as it says, more enigmatic and more elusive. Um, anyone who haven't read it, I, I'll put it in the chat. It's very poetic. And I think it's the process of that. My understanding is that Calvino wrote this with a bit of semanticism and a bit of constructive, deconstructive, constructive structure. So this Baudelaire uh, quote was actually quite, uh, come to me, very relevant at the moment. Thank you. I have to say, I find this sentence also a little bit enig enigmatic um, because he talks about a rule, an absolute rule. Um, and he uses the past tense, the world as we received it, past tense. 
um, unintelligible, but I'm a little bit confused by that because we try to make the world intelligible, I suppose. Um, and then to return it a little bit more unintelligible. An artist to try to confuse it all the time. I was going to say exactly the same. He's making his statement more unintelligible the more you read it. Yes. But I think what Jonathan said about this being um, being a statement for an artist or a statement to an artist, I think that that's really true. When you allow the um, absolute progression of what you believe, um, if, you, if you hold on to a concept or any sort of, I think, if you hold on to a concept or any sort of framework too much, then you are in a meaning making phase where you try to understand and sort and parse. And as an artist, if you allow that, if you allow the impulse not to crystallize into an image or something like we were talking about, I don't remember, we were talking about that like two weeks before the impulse and image, but this um, resistance to form and staying with the unintelligible. And I think that there's an opening beyond language that comes from that kind of upside downness as a way of, as another valid way of being. You know, it's the, it's the opposite of how we think of progress. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I agree with that. If you're thinking of, an, of artists, yeah, I totally agree with that. But even, I was thinking, even philosophers, in a way, you're trying to get out of maybe conventional framing of the world through language, but through the mental structures of the pres of a present time, and sort of see past it. So I feel, I don't know, it, like trying to think beyond the framings that we have, trying to see what's there. And I just, I guess, I don't know, it makes me think opening onto the mystery, the mystery of, it's like, yeah. That makes sense. It's a valid representation, isn't it? Yeah. Let's go into the next section. Uh, Joseph Kudelka, 1938. Joseph Kudelka is a French Czech photographer and member of Magnum Photos. His practice is based upon sustained travels through which he generated work within a variety of themes such as Gypsies, 1975, and Exiles, 1988. Gypsies, 1966. We'll linger for a minute on the photographs. I would like to see everything, look at everything. I want to be the view itself. Joseph Kudelka. Portugal, Augenblick means the blink of the eye or a decisive moment of time that is fleeting. The photographs of Kudelka have a distinctive sense of time and place which captures a restlessness of the fleeting moment. The here being of the situation is disclosed within a process of attending to. Spain, 1971. If anyone wants to say anything about each photograph as they come up, then just just say. By photographing theatre the same way I photograph real life, I learn to see the world as theatre. To photograph the theatre of the world interests me more. With the gypsies, it was there, it was theatre too. The difference was that the play had not been written and there was no director. There were only actors. It was a theatre of life. All I had to know was how to react. Spain, 
Gypsies, 1966. In the classical conception of time, Kiros is the instant, that is to say, the quality of the time of the instant, the moment of rupture and opening of temporality. It is the present, but a singular and open present. Antonio Negri. Prague, 1968. Seeing as a sensible outward appearance of a thing is not the understanding of the essence of that thing. Rather, there is also a form of seeing that is in advance of the thing. This is not an image, but rather governs the order of being. The artwork in the form of these photographs is a fold of these two modes of seeing. You read that again. Seeing as the sensible outward appearance of a thing is not the understanding of the essence of that thing. Rather, there is also a form of seeing that is in advance of the thing. This is not an image, but rather governs the order of being. The artwork in the form of these photographs is a fold of these two modes of seeing. Joseph Kodalka, Waka Jarabina, Slovakia from Gypsies, 1966. Seeing holds together the simultaneity of what is present, whereas the sense of what has been, as vision, lends to this appearance constancy of presence. In this way, seeing becomes connected with knowing. To see is in this way already to have seen, thus a mode of bringing forth. Prague, 1968. The glance places the viewer in the moment, but also out of time, so combines the momentary with the continuous. In this way, the photograph is a product of both continuity and discontinuity, succession and rupture. Prague, 1968. The photograph records or is a record of a subject looking back at one who is looking into the field of vision. As such, it is a form of double subjectivity or a loop of becoming in which something is retained, like a presence of a gap of something that cannot be completed. The photograph is thus an edge that ruptures the sense of, the th of things being in their place. Prague, 1968. To look, to look at is also the anticipation of something looking back, even if that something is inanimate. A glance at the world is also the experience of that glance returning to me. It is also a redistribution of temporality in that in that was is in the present is submitted to what is past. Exiles 1987, that's a really famous photograph. Hmm. <clears throat> Something leaps out and then loops back. Nothing is retained as an all in oneness, but rather is recorded as a latency. This is what secures depth within the perceptual circuit. The glance is a grasping at time as duration that implies an open future within an act of becoming or the invention of the new. Exiles 1972. 
Just to say in that photograph, I think it's really interesting the way there's no detail in the jackets. They're just black and very solid looking. Um, but there's detail in the in the faces. I think it's quite an interesting way of portraying their subjectivity using, you know, the grayscale, I guess, and deciding not to have detail in their in these jackets and trousers. I also wonder how much of this is actually designed and staged to those figures on the back along the edge it was just happens I think quite nicely to me it works together he could have just three people at the front nothing on the background but there are people looking outward on the back as well and I think it's like the figures at the back seem like a sort of more like the idea of a family or a group that are very together and then he calls it exiles with these three people at the front, these guys that look sort of, you know, a bit traumatised. He's got them kneeling, um, which is um, adds to the sense of maybe um, something to do with being exiled or something to do with not being able in some way or not being part of. To glance is to cut into the fabric of the visual field. To photograph is to insinuate into the interior of the subject in question and to breach the continuum of the cloth of duration. Thus, a series of photographs exhibits a perforation of a discrete order of reality. Joseph Kudelka, Exiles, Carnival, Olomouc, Moravia, 1968. I mean, each one of them also holds something astonishing in it, you know, there's whether it's the this incredible light or the incredible and there's reverence in every one of them also, you know, there's some sort of divinity um, in the everyday and uh, yeah, they're they're astonishing. Yeah. At the centre of the photograph, a boy is riding a bicycle dressed as an angel. To the side, a woman looks on with the heads of two horses on the other side of the frame. It is as, it is as if the boy is breaking the continuum of everyday life by becoming its other. Joseph Kudelka, Exiles, England, 1969. It is autumn and a thick layering of leaves provides a blanket covering for the earth. A body of a boy is lost under this blanket with only his head in the open. It is a rare image that is constructed out of the dynamic of revealing and concealing. Exiles, Guadi, Granada, Andalusia, Spain, 1971. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> like something in the spiritual, you know, in that ghostly light, no matter what the action is that causes it. Yes. Documentary photography is or goes in search of the truth of what took place and within this, a refinement of the fact of it taking place in the first place. This points towards the passage of becoming of what is passing, a mode of transience. Exiles, Gypsies, Brittany, France, 
A man looks upwards at a ball. A woman appears to look downwards towards the earth. A young woman with her face hidden is perhaps lost in thought, so looks inwards, and the horse in the background of the field is looking away from these three figures. Exiles Mental Hospital, Sicily, 1985. Within a glance of the eye, there is a spontaneous absorption of the world, which often leads also to a lack of attention. Between these polar opposites of absorption and inattention, something passes through, but it is also retained. As a practice, photography is a way of being with the play of this difference. Let's just stay with the memory of what we're looking at. So what were the thoughts in this section on this photographer, extraordinary photographs? Just um, his ability to, um, fr his framing is incredible and, and the, the, the way he catches these moments where it appears that all the players have been put in place, but it, actually he's just managed to catch it. I mean, for instance, I don't think he could have set this up because, well, I think it'd be quite tricky to have set this up. Um, but it's like all these little individual people in their own world, all in exile, all separated, not much togetherness. Um, and it just manages to bring out their suffering and, and the tragedy of, um, of what they must be going through on a mental level. But just mentally looking at this photo, I, I feel in somewhere in an in-between state. You have these people lying on the ground, this fellow with the hooded jacket coming to you, then fellow with no clothes on or woman or whatever behind him. It just, it's a very odd photo. So you're just kind of in, in limbo looking at it. And where, where do you feel yourself in it? And then too, with many of these images, there's something the titles are so psychologically loaded and the images are so psychologically loaded, but there's also something very sculptural about them. You know, the one with the ball up in the air, they, they play with depth of, depth of field. And so there's this like empathy and compassion in the subject matter, but formally just the object itself has this incredible um, sculptural spatial quality, I think, um, to, to most of them and this sort of sense of surprise, yeah. Yeah, and also the, that he, um, he's obviously spending a lot of time with these groups. Um, you get the impression that he's really somehow, I mean, they, they must have accepted him on some level to, to allow him <clears throat> to photograph them, particularly, you know, so-called gypsies who could be quite antagonistic towards a photographer, I imagine. And then within that closeness to find this moment with this, this triple beat across the top, you know, ball cute, what is that shack or ball house horse? Yeah. <laughs> the grouping <clears throat> three people in action. It has this sort of like, yeah, I don't know. Um, this photo and the mental hospital photo seems they both seem similar similar um, to me. I feel like if I didn't see the title of the photos, I feel uh, religious in somehow. I can feel some religious feeling and randomness is increasing from certain uh, direction to certain direction. I feel. I would imagine he would have uh, like tons and tons of shots this big and then pick the ones like this one or at the mental hospital. It's really capturing that size thing. It's the otherness that was mentioned a bit, uh, earlier in the flitting moment and all of these things are together. <clears throat> so what I'm trying to say is I can appreciate the time and effort and all those countless shots went behind until he reaches in this one. 
this is it kind of thing. I think I see. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Go on, go. On. No, I was just going to say I I found those photographs of um, 1968 in Czechoslovakia. Um, really incredible. I mean, I I was alive. I was like a kid then um, when that all happened, and it was splashed all over the news, and um, it was quite momentous. Uh, Russian tanks rolling into Czechoslovakia. And a lot of people had to flee and, you know, people were, uh, there was a lot of turmoil. And um, I'm just comparing it with what's happening in Ukraine today. And the fact that he's got these photographs, um, it's quite remarkable. Like he's, um, the most, he's quite fearless, really, to stand in front of that tank Um so just, I'm just contrasting it with what, I mean, I don't think many people would want to stand in front of a Russian tank today to take a photograph. Um, so it's like a, like a different kind of invasion almost like, I mean, I think the Russians would expect, it, expect on some level to be welcomed. But yeah, I don't know, it's just interesting on a historical level, let alone a photographic level. Don't know if you've got anything to say about that, Jonathan. I remember it quite well. Um, I mean, it was as if I mean, they just drove the tanks into Prague and took over. And they, it's true, they they were told they would be greeted as liberators, and. Uh, they were just, he looked at photographs of troops and they looked confused all the time. Yeah. Disorientated. So it's when the, I mean, there was the Hungarian uprising, I think in 56, um, which was brutal, but wasn't recorded, whereas this was recorded much more. And. Uh, Less brutal, I think. That's brutal. I mean, it was more, they just took over by just sheer force. It's very hard to fight tanks. Um, so it wasn't like a slaughter. But it sort of closed the door, closed the boundaries. Yeah. And it was, the Vietnam War was beginning to expand at that time. So he had two wars, he had the Vietnam War with images of planes dropping napalm bombs and he had the tanks coming into Prague. So it was 66, 67, 67 I think was the summer of love. Um, so he got California, the summer of love, Vietnam and then Czechoslovakia. And then you had 68, the um, Paris uprising, the student rebellion. So they all connected together. And it was the age of psychedelic rock music. So you tended to get films with music in the background. What about the writing? Is that not explained, but does it help with the reading of the photographs or does it injure the reading of the photograph? Uh, I mean, I, you know, obviously when you're reading it, you don't necessarily take all of it in, but I, I, um, I just en enjoyed your um, way of talking about these photographs in relation to you know this idea of transience and stuff and so I thought it was really interesting I'd like to read it again well I will read it again um and I, I was comparing uh the paintings of Ver um yeah. Vermeer with these photographs because uh, this idea of you know is catching these moments like Vermeer's 
paintings that could be photographs, sort of almost, I don't know if they predate photography. Well, they also were probably painted with camera obscura. Right. So there is a photographic element to them. Yeah. The idea of pulling the concept of the moment from from one across to the other is it's interesting because it's sort of looking at that from different, you know, different apparatus. Expands the moment or folds the moment. I also like the fact that you're not sort of doing that classic thing of using Roland Barthes and uh, um, the idea of the punctum and all that. You're kind of taking it away from that and the idea of death and photography and everything. You're just you're doing something else, which I like. Okay, so who will read? Anyone volunteer? Well, <clears throat> I'm happy to have a go. Okay, so fire away. Not as good as voice as some of the others, but there you go. In the book, Agua Viva, there is an aim to capture the present, but it is a book without a story or plot. Instead, it explores the limits of language and in so doing, takes the reader to regions of reception that might in advance be deemed as impossible. At the heart of this impossibility are a series of meditations on the instant and what follows are a fragmentary selection of them. Everything has an instant in which it is. I want to grab hold of the is of the thing. These instants passing through the air I breathe. In fireworks they explode silently in space. I want to possess the atoms of time. Clarence Lyspector. What, what a... Clarice Lyspector, sorry. Clarice. What, what a piece of writing. Wow. It would be Walter Benjamin there in another era. Yeah. Wonderful. I pin down sudden instants that carry within them their own death and others are born. I pin down the instance of metamorphosis and there's a terrible beauty in their sequence and concurrence. But the instant now is a firefly that sparks a firefly that sparks and goes out, sparks and goes out. The present is the instant in which the wheel of the speeding car just barely touches the ground. I am at this instant in a white void awaiting the next instant. Measuring time is just such a working hypothesis. But whatever exists is perishable and this forces us to measure immutable and permanent time. What am I in this instant? I am a typewriter making the dry keys echo in the dark and humid early hours. New instant in which I see what is coming. Though to speak of the instant of vision, I must be more discursive than the instant. Many instants will pass before I unfold and exhaust the single and quick complexity of a glance. Ah, this flash of instance never ends. My chant of the it never ends. Okay. That's... 54 years lighting up the sky. No, we'll leave that. We'll just go back to Couch Respecter. Um. Yeah. As I say, I, li I like the writing. It's fabulous. Very evocative. 
I think this it's getting at that same thing of the trembling producing the fragment, which is that foundation that exists before the instant is passing. I, I like that there's sort of a, you can see some sort of a commonality across the three inspections of the moment and their, their possible constructions. Yeah. I, sorry, go ahead. One thing I was observing on the photograph, and it's nice to see with the, in relation to the painting and now with the text, is that in his photographs, you have the title is, is the place and, and the, the year, but the photo is an instant. That, so the instant represents the year, the same place that the, the particular place represents the city. Like, uh, and uh, in Clarice Lispector's writing, I think there's the same. So she's always looking for this moment that is uh, about to happen. She's writing of, of, of what is right in front of her as, as it comes to her mind. But then it, it it starts to represent a larger chunk of time. Um, and um, I don't know if it's the same for the media as well, but with the photograph, I think it's, um, so there's, so uh, it's always stretching the time because it's, um, Um, I, th I think that goes um, a lot in relation with the, with the uh, um, Baudrillard's uh, text of getting uh, uh, of, um, of getting out of of, uh, of the frame of. Uh, to, to expand, um, so um, so the text uh, for Clarice, I think, expands the same way uh, as it does with time for the photographer. Uh, does it make sense? So, mm. Last section. We'd like to read, it's on Zen Enzo paintings. I can read. Good. 54 years lighting up the sky, a quivering, quivering lip smashes a billion words, ha. Huh? Entire body looks for nothing. Living, I plunge into yellow springs. Dojen Gen Z, Dojen asked, what is the Buddha? Seko replied, it is in inside the temple. If it is inside the temple, can it be in every grain of sand of the river? Seko answered, it is in every grain of sand of the river. The conversation is settled, concluded Tojen. Nakahara Nantembo, 1839-1925, Enzo. The Enzo signifies the circle of enlightenment. In the sixth century or oh, sixth century, the Shinjin Mei referred to the great way of Zen as a circle like vast space, lacking nothing and nothing in excess. This statement was sometimes used as an inscription with an Enzo painting. The earliest recorded Enzo painting was composed in the A. 8th century. Tore Enzo, 18th century.
The Chinese Buddhist monk Zhu Qing described enlightenment as dropping the dust from the mind. Without the accumulation of dust on the surface of the mirror, there is the utmost capacity to reflect reality. Zhu Qing practiced face-to-face -face transmission outside of the scriptures. Hakuin Enzo, 18th century. It was both a painter and a monk. He, he um, was responsible for the what, what is the sound of one unclapping. The priest Dojen, 13th century, was the founder of the Soto School of Zen. Dojen experienced enlightenment when he visited China and met the priest Chu Qing. He described this experience as dropping the body and mind. Dojen said on his return to Japan as being empty-handed and with the real realization that the eyes are horizontal and the nose is vertical. Oh, young folk, if you fear death, die now. Having died once, you won't die again. Hakuin and Kaku. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Segai Enzo, Endo period. Shugetsu. Chu Ho Su and so late 80th or early 19th century. The Enzo presents the opening toward the infinite or the identification with emptiness, Mu. Tore Enzo Edo, 80th century. The Enzo goes beyond representation because it touches upon the paradox of presenting everything whilst at the same time symbolizing the void. Benkei Yotaku, 1622 to 1693, Enzo. A one second drawing that takes a lifetime of practice to achieve. Well, wow, that's really nice to have the bibliography like that at the end with the covers and everything. Oh, poor portraits. Very disparate mediums and not not a literal connection. No, but like we've been sort of finding, I think that you can you can find your way through it even with the moment that it takes, the one second that it takes to make the circle. You know, it's the same sort of idea of the threshold of time, I think kind of weaves through all of these or supports the arguments. I um, just wanted to say something about this, this like this. Um, uh, I, I guess um, Clarice Spector talks about it in her writing. This idea 
of this minute this this idea of now which is infinitely minute um and i was just thinking about that in relation to um the sublime so you have this you know the mathematical sublime which is kind of infinite um but it's it's almost like the sublime in reverse it's so small you can't really imagine it um and i think she the way she writes it sort of conjures up that that sense somehow um yeah yeah it's all the things below the threshold she captures things which you, you ordinarily just passes by you don't pay attention to it and she she captures it I mean, she said she had that phrase, the atoms of time. I think there's definitely something there because the, uh, who was it? I, I, I'm, you have reminded me of who this was three times. So I'm, this will be my last question time I ask, who said that the sensation of the sublime was the imagination reading, trembling at its limit and recoiling upon its own. Oh, let's see. It was Nancy. Okay. The I sublime will... offering. Yeah. So that, that the sublime offering. So that reminds me, Vonda, very much about what you're saying, that there's this, um, there's this trembling, which sort of makes multiple moments. And to me, the sublime is always attached to mortality and the realization of mortality and that recoil is also a kind of fragmentation. You know, it's a pulling away from or tearing. I think it makes that sort of ruptured sense of time. And why, that's why it's so why people seek it, because it's an other it's an other way of being. And it's so momentary that it's like atomizing. Yeah. We I just, oh, sorry, go on there. Sorry, Jonathan. We tend to have big time history and uh, narrative, and um, big signifiers of big passages of time. So I, I guess these were just. Like just a glance of the eye, what you capture in the glance of the eye, or perception of something passing through which is hardly perceptible. Or, I mean, I think it's interesting with Vermeer that Vermeer disappeared as an artist. He couldn't, I mean, it's like he couldn't be seen. Um, he was outside of the narrative of Dutch culture for a long time. And it wasn't until an Impressionist critic in France brought attention to his work that he started to become a figure again. But he disappeared for, from the 17th century to the mid-19th century. So 200 years he disappeared as an artist of any merit. He was unrecorded for a long time. And it's extraordinary, you think he's one of the most revered artists of our time. He has an extraordinary status, but he, he, he disappeared. In his own lifetime, uh, did he, what, what kind of status did he achieve? Or did he also disappear? Do you well, know? Part of a, a circle of Enlightenment thinkers. He, he was quite he was sophisticated. So he's part of a whole culture in Holland. Um, but he wasn't recognised like Rembrandt or... I mean, he only left about 35 paintings. He wasn't commercial. He, he wasn't turning out... Wasn't he painting in his house? He painted in his house. With his kids, he had like six kids running around and all kinds of chaos. And yeah, I think it's amazing that he that he painted such moments of total stillness when you think of where his studio was with all those children and all the 
And I think also his father was like a, was a merchant. So there was like, they lived near the trading. There was a lot of trading and stuff like that going around his studio. But you say, Jonathan, that he would disappeared for 200 years. Well, you could say the same might be happening to say somebody like Henry Moore, you know, has, you know, was very, very much up there 30, 40, 50 years ago, and now has disappeared from sight or near, near about. Mm. I mean, it's a lot easier for people to disappear altogether than not make a return. I mean, it's usual that thousands of artists disappear and never return. I suppose that's okay if you're thinking about it in terms of not ever having appeared anyway. Like mm. if the aim is not to appear, but to to speak in some some of these ways that we're talking about then the appearance of the work happens when it's ready to be seen or not at all i guess and then with ensos are they are they art or are they religion or poetry or are they just not categorizable as anything they're philosophical, as well as poetic, as Kate says. But what can you say about them? It's as if they hold these little, like, their aphorisms of, you know, like, the Enzo itself, you mean the circle? Yeah, the circle. Um, I mean, you... you the, the, you had these aphorisms accompanying them, which I thought was quite interesting. Mm. Like, lacking nothing and nothing in excess. Um, yeah, I found, I found your presentation of them very poetic and philosophical. Mm. I thought it was interesting. Well, a demonstration of, of a state of mind. They present something which is unobtainable or you might do one and so in your life, or you might do them quite regularly. Um, but they seem to affirm a state of enlightenment rather than a state of attainment of an aesthetic. And it's almost Clarice Lispector almost practices writing in a similar way. She does a book where there's no narrative, there's no story, there's no, no book in a way. <coughs> but you savor these sentences which are just extraordinary. So it's, it's a sort of removes form. In a way, in a way it removes the idea of it being a book, a form, a, a narrative. And it's just an event of language. I thought it was interesting. Um, I haven't read Clarice My Spectre, but I thought it was her writing, all well, the bits that um, you read, um, were it was very reflective upon the inability to capture this moment. Like she's trying to get at and she's trying to get to this present state and it's it's her it seemed to be her thinking about the impossibility and constantly reflecting on on that in contrast i guess to the other works um and the other writing which seems to be opening onto that moment itself i mean or capturing this presence or this surface and getting to this kairos, this moment of being, this opening. I mean, I'm not saying that she doesn't get to that, but it's just, it seemed to be much more about the 
consciousness that's trying to do that rather than the pure exposure present. the pure exposure to a condition so like the I mean I think there's something kind of quite consistent about the four um, fragments or four episodes um, in terms of exposure to a condition so the photographs capture something which you think is is almost impossible, is miraculous. The more you look at them, the more you think these momentary events, but they seem to capture something which is um, just irrepeatable. Um, for me, it captures something which is is very repetitive. He's like he's doing the same painting again and again and again. It's just light fall, falling on a, in a room on a figure. So something passing through. So as if he can't quite capture his, in the painting what he wants to show. So he's forced to repeat. He never progresses. Uh, yet they're seemingly perfect or the closest you can get to perfection in a painting. So the sentence of the respect to which are just extraordinary. You think, wow, where did that sentence come from? You want to linger on it. You want to know where it, it comes from. But it's impossible to find the form of generating it. And there's Zen Enso's. Extraordinary, just the same form, but so different, such, such a, a shock to the system, like electricity passing through space and standing still for a, a second and moving on. I mean, I think I put it together as a way of trying to slow down how to be an artist, how to linger on something which is maybe seemingly insignificant. So the, it, it's, a, it's not a didactic, pro, it's not a didactic presentation. It's not historical. It's not, it's, it just does something to you. It has an effect, but Effect is mysterious. It's a very, um, it's a great combination that you put together. I can't remember why I'd put it together. I mean, it's just, I was thinking about transience and uh, how to just capture transience and it just came together. One of them. Um, um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm um, very blind, so I couldn't see the photographs um, or other images in great detail. But I um, looked very closely um, to get what I could. And one of the things which um, struck me um, and this relates to the question about the Enzos, was in that picture of the mental asylum, how the floor or the the ground, if it was outside, I don't know, was, um, was in these grids, these kind of big slabs of concrete or tile, um, and how the bodies were um, kind of stretched out, sort of breaking these um, grids. Um, and then in the Clarice, um, the spectre, um, yeah, that, that line struck me as well, that she was searching for atoms of time, these um, distinct particles of um, um, of, of, of sort of a defined um, scale. 
Um, and the even the images from Exiles and Gypsies struck me almost like um, stills from a Beckett play. Um, I'm not sure if I was saying it correctly, but you know, there was this, the bowler hats, and then it was you know the, the the kind of the dress and the sort of sitting around as as if waiting or you know not really sure what was happening, and there was something as as was said, I think very sort of spatial almost about moving around a grid. And I was thinking, I'm not a photographer, but you know, the image will be on a particular, I imagine, rectangular or square presentation. And in comparison to, to those kind of attempts to grid time and sort of, I don't know, conceptualize it, I suppose, um, the Enzo's, which weren't actually circles in a sort of pure sense, they seem to be kind of ovals or kind of bubbles or kind of slightly misshapen balloons. They, they, they didn't have the... Um, kind of the clearly the rectilinear, rectilinear kind of um, ambition for structure as um, some of those other images. So that was, you know, some kind of reflection that I had on the, the contrast, but I appreciate that that um, presented sort of dichotomy is, is in itself an attempt to kind of uh, contain and uh, understand but there was yeah sort of something about that I find found it found interesting did you just say something about who you are because the first time you've been oh yeah thanks um I'm I'm Alex um and um uh, Jonathan has very kindly just taken over my supervision um, for a PhD by practice um, and um, um, I, mentioned, I mentioned I was um, blind um, and I was um, um, you know, lost my sight about uh, 15 years ago or something um, and I'm interested in terms of my work I mean lots of different things but um uh, at one level, I'm interested in how to um, translate images in my head um, into images other people can um, perceive in some ways without going through visual mediums, which I might find challenging. Um, and then um, I, I lost my eyesight in the military. And, and so I'm also interested in, I suppose, the the ethics and the um, uh, inexpressibility maybe of some of the experiences that that kind of um, vocation or job might might create. And, and I think a bit about Wittgenstein um, in my work, um, his earlier work, um, which also kind of maybe relates to notions of a kind of uh, crystalline moment of time um there was, it seemed to be a lot that, um that i found quite evocative uh, from, from the presentation today in relation to that so yeah um and i live in london like for me i'm not surrounded by six kids but a couple of young children and chaos thank you It's really nice to meet you and lovely to have you. Thanks. Yes, like to hear that. And thanks for telling us about your um, your journey, as it were, into the arts. It's an interesting proposition. Alex's reading is doing a reading of Tractatus by Wittgenstein. And... Um, it's got a rather interesting purchase on it. Could you just say what, what the proposal is? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, thanks, Jonathan. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if this, this is what you're kind of alluding to, but um, uh, Wittgenstein... Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how, how familiar people are with his 
Tractatus, but he wrote it. He, Wittgenstein's life is very extraordinary, and he um, was in the First World War fighting for the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, under incredibly traumatic uh, circumstances, often in the front line, um, during these huge battles on the Eastern Front, and and then in Italy, and he was then in a prisoner of war camp for a year. Um, and simultaneously, his um, I mean, there were lots of real his traumas about his life. A couple, of, um, two of his brothers took their own life. One of one of one of them was very seriously injured in the war. Um, um, but the Tractatus, I think, is often seen as quite a kind of cold work of logic, but but a but a mysterious one, which many artists um, uh, and uh, and poets uh, and writers have, have found some kind of kind of gnomic spiritual um, interest or, or insight within. Um, but his process for writing it was that they were real sort of uh, fragments, almost atoms of of personal experience. During his war, he kept these diaries, his war notes, and he would think about things and then jot them down but often kind of fragmented and disjointed from um, from any coherent um, project. And then at the end of the war, partly while he was on leave and partly while he was in a prisoner of war camp, he sort of mobilized and curated them into the work that we have today. Um, and part of my uh, project is to um, think about... Um, how someone who's been through an experience like that might need to create very strict structure um, around their thoughts and about the way they think about things. So I, I think about grids and mathematical ways of conceptualizing our, our experience. Um, but, um, but also how there's a sort of uh, uh, um, quite an intimate poetry of um, of his war experience within within that sort of what might appear to be um, abstract analytic logic, um, and my proposal is that I try to um, to some extent use some of my own personal experiences to illuminate. You know, it's a conceit, of course, huge differences, but in terms of the experience of war um, to try and illuminate some of the um, intimacy of the poetry of the philosophical work, the Tractatus. That's how I'm trying to think about it. Um, and it is very much concerned with the limits of what can be experienced, what can be articulated through language and symbol. Um, and so, um, there's a, there is an, an evocation of the of the void, uh, maybe in a similar way to to an Enzo that you kind of you know represent what can be represented as a way of trying to silhouette that against um, what cannot. Um, that's my project. Thank you. I couldn't have. Uh represented a quarter of that. Oh, very happy that you've done that. Any questions? This... Hi, Kim. Um, this is Rong, and it's really nice to meet you today. I just want to <clears throat> tell you that I'm currently commissioned by British Council for making a public scu sculpture for blind people. And uh, <clears throat> it's really lucky to have you here today and i'm wondering if you have a moment could we could like um you can take a look or even give me some advice or even collaborate with me about this upcoming um public sculpture that will be really awesome and i sent you a message so so just want to say hi to you Okay, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'd be delighted to to, to, to chat to, to chat to you about your work. Um, I um, I, I, I 
so actually slightly embarrassingly i struggled to sign into this meeting and my wife who who is um i don't know if if her email came up but um it, it's she, she's korean so i don't know if, if that yeah. was so oh, yeah, it was but, but but um uh but um my own uh uh name <laughs> is is alexander donnelly so um i'll i don't know the best way of you of you getting my email or, or um it's alexander donnelly at hotmail.co.uk if, if you want to email me and we can talk about that project which sounds sounds very interesting thank you alexander ron could you just say something about your exhibition to the rest of the group that everyone's seen it um my hi everyone um i i'm currently have a solo exhibition at sachi gallery and uh, it's my first solo exhibition mm, there's a lot of different material and machine vibrate vibrator and transportation machine and keep making the sound of the breaking glass and uh, I use plastic to mimic the sound of um, rain and also mimic the sound of a wave from the ocean. So um, I hope everybody can enjoy to see my show. Yeah. <laughs> can I ask how long it's on for? Uh, it's until the end of March. I'd love to see it. I'll try and get there. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you meet you there Vonda text me <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah Alex can I tell you something this is Ryu I'm also Korean uh and really nice to see you I've seen you a couple of times for Wednesday lecture Wednesday lec uh, lunch lecture um I can't articulate well enough, but I think it's really interesting. You, it sounds like you you are trying to um, trying to uh, deal your traumatic experience into some mathematical way. Sound it sounds like it, and I am. It sounds really interesting. I would love to see how it goes. I would love to see. Um, your work one day. Me too. Thank you. <laughs> you can say you've got a scientific background as well. Oh, yes. I have an organic chemistry degree. So mm. uh, I am I am very, I'm, my brain works better for science and number. <laughs> and just to move sideways, Vanda is also a doctor. Uh, so got not sure how scientific doctors really are though <laughs> just throwing that into the mix <laughs> it's really lovely to meet you all thanks for being so welcoming so where are we next week We've got someone to make a presentation. Who's that? Who's who wants to make a presentation of the work? There's still to come. Vanda's still got to come. Um, Ron has got to come. Um, I've got to come. <laughs> We'll do a, there'll be a PowerPoint and a presentation, but who would like to do a presentation? Did this term Lester had presented yet? No, I'm pretty much almost there with stuff that I've been working on, so I could do it fairly soon, but I wouldn't mind deferring for a little bit, but can do if needs be. I'll do it. 
I'll, uh, I'll come up with a PowerPoint. Uh, and that's all. Do an announcement in two days. Um, are there any more thoughts about today?